Delighted to see so many people here this morning. Uh, kind of hard to believe. Uh, my name is Tom <laughs> Hodge. Um, no, it's a, you know, I need to congratulate you because you've, um, not because you have someone special uh, here at Wellesley College, namely the student that you're here um, in honor of, but because you found a library lecture room. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the hardest to find places on the campus. Um, so anyway, uh, um, my name is Tom. I teach in the Russian department here at Wellesley. I've been here for 23 years. Um, I am a proud graduate of a liberal arts college myself. I went to Pomona College, um, and then grad school at Oxford, Stanford, and the first and only job I've had full time is right here at Wellesley College. So, for almost a quarter century, this is where I've uh, made my teaching home, and I love it here. And I congratulate all of you on having your student be a student here. Um, she's getting a great deal even though it may not seem like that sometimes <laughs> when you read the bank account. But, um, and I say this also not only as someone who teaches here, but um, as somebody who has a couple of kids. I've got a nine-year-old, I've got a 15-year-old, um, and my 15-year-old is already thinking about where he may end up. So I know a lot of what goes through your minds. Um, I just wanted to find out who you are a little bit. Um, how many of you would classify yourself as family of the Wellesley student? Almost everybody. How many would you would classify yourselves as friends of the student? Okay. Of those, of the, so how many of you family are parents of the student? How many of you are not parents? Of, okay, so you're all parents. All right. yeah. <laughs> how many of you have come more than fifty miles to get here? How many of you have come more than five hundred miles to get here? Wow. <laughs> how many of you have come more than a thousand miles to get here? Um, okay. Um, how many of you have come 3,000 miles to be here? Wow. Does that mean West Coast? No, it's good. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm from the Bay Area myself, so I'm from California. Um, and it's okay if you're not from California. So. Does, does anybody come from farther away? I'm just curious. Yeah? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Wow. The antipodes. <laughs> That's amazing. There should be some kind of award for that. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, that's pretty amazing. Um, I hope that we'll have a chance to um, have a conversation and have a discussion. Uh, my understanding is that, I've never done this before, so I'm just sort of making this up, but my understanding is that I can offer a few comments and then um, maybe at the end of it all we can, we can talk. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about was, in theory, the, the, the topic of, um, or the title of this um, set of comments that I wanted to make, and that is, um, will the humanities make your daughter human? Um, I confess to you that I sort of made that up just to be provocative. I'm not <laughs> trying to imply that your daughter is not already human. Um, <laughs> although if, yeah, I see some of you kind of thinking, well, maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe my 15-year-old, sometimes he's a wonderful young man, but sometimes he seems a little subhuman. He's locked into the mobile device. Mm -hmm. He's going from activity to activity. Um, there's already, he's only a sophomore in high school, but there's already that sense that he's racking up um, the achievements that he's going to need to end up where he needs to end up in college. And I think all of that can be a little dehumanizing. I don't know if you feel that way. I'm already sensing it. And, um, and I, I see it also sometimes in students. Um, they arrive here a little bit subhuman. Um, and one of the joys of my job is that I see them cast off some of that. You know, there's, and your family and your students are to be congratulated for this, that they made it, they made it to a place having racked up all those achievements, activities, um, where they can relax and go after learning what it is that they want to learn. At least that's the ideal. Um, so I wanted to say just a few things about the humanities. Um, I am the faculty building director of Founders Hall and Green Hall here at the college, and that's where most of the humanistic uh, disciplines are housed. Um, the departments and programs we normally classify as humanities. Um, I will confess to you, though, that I have not I've been doing this job, the building director job, for four months. I, I still don't exactly know what the humanities are. 
it, I found they're impossible to, to define according to department or program. The college has several different definitions of which, which departments are the humanistic ones, which are not. Um, I'm perfectly aware of the dictionary definition of the humanities, which is uh, that branch of learning, which is not divinity, that is to say, not theology, um, back in the universities of Europe. Um, so there was theology on the one hand, which was studying what God has made, and there was the humanities, which is directed towards studying what human beings make. Um, but it's, it's complicated, so I finally realized in order to figure out how many humanities professors there were at this institution, I had to just pull them and say, do you consider yourself a humanist or not? And that's, sort of, I, that's how I figured it out. There are about 170 some odd of us. That's almost half the faculty at this college. Um, the humanities really um, form the basis of the reputation of this place <coughs> historically. Um, that has been our historical strength. We've added to that really strong science and social science. You know, and I'm not telling you anything you, you don't already know, and I'm not trying to sell the place to you. Um, but I do want to remind us all that the humanities were, were really how this place got started. Um, and I thought I would begin, since I'm a literature teacher, I spend <laughs> half my time teaching Russian language, the other half teaching Russian literature. Um, my scholarship is in the uh, Russian literature of the 19th century. Um, and I thought I would start with just a text. And this is a complete story. It's in 11 paragraphs. I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Luckily, each paragraph is about one sentence. <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's that big. It's, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it'll be boring. It's by um, a writer named Ivan Turgenev. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Turgenev, but he's an important uh, novelist, short story writer, of the mid to late 19th century in Russia. So there's Tolstoy, there's, there's Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and then kind of right behind him there's Turgenev. Important guy, I'm, writing, I'm in the middle of writing a book about him. Toward the end of his life, he wrote a series of short um, essays and stories that he called poems and prose. And I wanted to share one of these with you, and I'm not sure why this one came to me um, as one that might make sense, but it, it might be good to have something to refer back to as we talk. Um, so this is called The Dog, very simple. There are two of us in the room, my dog and I. Outside, a frightful, furious storm is howling. The dog sits before me and looks me straight in the eye. And I, too, gaze into her eyes. It's as if she wants to tell me something. She is mute. She has no words. She does not even understand herself. But I understand her. I understand that in this moment, in both her and in me, there lives one and the same feeling. That there is no difference between us. We are identical. In each of us, the same trembling little flame burns and shines. Death will swoop down and beat upon that flame with a cold, broad wing. And that's the end. Who in posterity will be able to tell precisely what kind of little flame burned within us? No, this is not an animal and a man exchanging glances. These are two pairs of the same eyes fastened upon one another. And in each of these pairs, in the animal and in the man, one identical life fearfully draws closer to the other. That's it. That's the dog. I'm not trying to suggest that your daughter is going to become more human by realizing that she is the same as a dog. <laughs> um, but I think there's something um, about that little sketch that made me think it might be right to share with you this morning because it is a lovely, clear example of what so much in the humanities um, does for us and for our students. It shows us that we are not just who we think we are. Um, we are not just who we were told we were born to be. We are many other things, and many other things are also us. Now, one very simple way to say that is, well, it's empathy or sympathy, depending on how you define those words. Um, the ability to 
look outside yourself, stand outside yourself, and see yourself as something or someone else, including a dog. Um, that ability, that focus is something that all of us, I think, in the humanities do um, as one of the sort of central activities of our work, both in our research and in our teaching. Um, it happens in the history department, the philosophy department, the religion department, art, music. Um, all of these disciplines take your daughter and put in, put in her hands and put before her creative work, so work that's created by humans, that in one way or another allows that student to step outside of herself, to see other ways of being, to see analogies for her own life. Um, and this kind of breeding of empathy is something that has been celebrated about um, the humanities for a long time. I mean, and I've been gathering suggestions from my humanities colleagues about what it is that we do and how do we define it and what are the humanities really and how do they relate to the other uh, divisions in the liberal arts, science and social science. And um, one thing that you hear sometimes um, is that, well, the humanities provide wisdom. The sciences provide knowledge. Or the humanities confront the student with the truth. Science and social science give the student facts. Um, and I have to say that I have some sympathy for some of those analogies for describing the way the different liberal arts interact with each other. Um, I do think that one of the greatest gifts we can give the women who come here is what f might simply be called wisdom. And by that I mean um, the knowledge that comes with living life for a long time. Now I look around the room, I see some people of my vintage, I mean I'm 53 years old, I don't claim to be a wise old man, I'm not. Um, my hair's been gray since I was about 30 years old, so I look like this for a while. Um, but I will say that I think I'm a lot wiser person than I used to be, certainly when I was in college at Pomona. Um, <laughs> and I do know, and I know it because I see it, and I know it because students tell me, that the reading of excellent literature, the listening um, to great music, the exposure to great art, the exposure to history and philosophy, all of these things do something that's a little bit magical, sort of miraculous, which is they allow, the really good stuff allows students to live extra lives, but not to spend much time doing it. So by the time my students have finished reading War and Peace, it's a novel I teach every other year, they're wiser. I mean, they have enabled through an active imagination, thanks to the great art that's being given to them, they are able to live Natasha's life, and Andre's life, and Pierre's life, and yet they're only a couple months older. It takes a couple months to get through that novel. Mm -hmm. And so in the four years that they're here, I do think the students are wiser because they have been allowed to, they've been enabled to and helped along in leading other lives. Um, these are not their real lives, these are other people's lives, but they are analogous lives, and they are lives that are no less real for simply being analogies to the student's own life. Um, so that's one way of looking at the uh, liberal arts and the way they interact with each other. Um, my wonderful colleague Larry Rosenwald, who teaches in the English department, um, exposed me to this great quotation by the poet Adrian Rich. She says, if the imagination is to transcend and transform experience, you have to be free to play around with the notion that day might be night, love might be hate. Nothing can be too sacred for the imagination to turn into its opposite or call experimentally by another name. So what she's getting at there, I think, is something that is equally true, which is that the humanities aren't there to give you the chance to live other lives and therefore be sympathetic or empathetic to someone else's experience. That is one thing that they do. The humanities are also there to teach you to step outside of the viewpoint that you have gotten used to. The humanities are there to keep you from getting too satisfied with your category, because the categories are arbitrary. Um, 
And to be able to step outside that category and step outside the thinking that is conventional thinking. One of my colleagues in the political science department has said that to him, the, liberal, the function of the liberal arts is to enable a student <clears throat> to at least temporarily occupy the unconventional viewpoint, which is a great thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I, most of us in the room, I think, are of a certain age, and we become used to thinking in a certain way, used to acting in a certain way. And one of the beauties of the liberal arts is that it teaches you that you need to kick yourself out of that little room and step out of the room and look back at where you were and look at other people and consider the proposition that day is night and night is day. Get out of your rut. Um, John Searle, who's a great um, philosopher, uh, getting on in years now at UC Berkeley, um, once wrote, one of the most liberating effects of liberal education is in coming to see one's own culture as one possible form of life and sensibility among others. We don't have a monopoly on the right way to think, the right way to live. And the humanities, among the liberal arts, offer us example after example after example of beautifully presented, provocatively presented examples of ways of life and ways of thought. Um, so this relationship among the, the three divisions at the, at the college has been something that I've thought a lot about, as I said. Um, and I, I thought I'd maybe wrap up by describing an, uh, some other ways I've heard them described. Um, I, a student the other day after Russian, I'm teaching Russian 101, so elementary Russian grammar, um, she came up after class and she said, so what if when I'm taking the grammar quiz, I don't know the vocabulary. Um, what should I do? I mean, what's more important, the, gra the, the vocabulary, knowing the words, or knowing the grammar? And I said, you know, I wish I had a solution for you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you have to know one and the other and put them together. <laughs> um, because this is not a class in sort of abstract grammar. Um, and it made me realize that she was, she was getting at a a really important dichotomy in linguistics. I don't know how many of you are linguistics fans, but um, we talk about we talk about um, paradigms and syntax. So the paradigm is, or the is in really fancy language among linguists, it gets called the paradigmatic axis. So um, and syntax gets called the syntagmatic axis. What do we mean by this? Well. Um, if you say something like, um, John loves his wife, um, on the paradigmatic axis, which is sort of a vertical axis, you can take the word wife and realize that that word was selected from a whole host of other alternatives. Could have said helpmate, could have said girlfriend, could have said spouse, could have said friend. I mean, there are a whole bunch. Um, but you chose wife, so that's the part of the paradigm that you, you picked. And then there's the syntagmatic axis, which goes horizontally. And it simply refers to syntax, which is something that most of us know about. It's the order in which we put the words together. So we, if we'd said the wife loves John, or his wife loves John, that has a different meaning. So the syntax in which we put things, um, that determines the meaning. So every time we speak, we are negotiating those two axes. You know, which word are we going to select, and what order are we going to put them in, to put it bluntly. And this student was getting at that, uh, that combination of syntax and paradigm. And it made me think that, you know, one of the metaphors that we might use to describe the way the different divisions of college interact with each other is that um, humanities don't have a monopoly on wisdom, I, I, I wouldn't suggest that. Um, humanities, perhaps, are more oriented toward providing the syntax of life. The sciences are more <laughs> oriented toward, perhaps, providing the paradigms of life. Um, in other words, perhaps what's happening is the humanities are giving your daughter the grammar that she can use to put together the elements of her life. The sciences are teaching her what those elements are, perhaps. Um, it, I don't think it's as simple as the truth on the side of humanities and facts on the side of 
um, science. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, you know, on the one hand, we could say, you know, my, my colleagues in the philosophy department um, and the, philosoph the philosophers who taught me when I was at Pomona used to talk a lot about Aristotle versus Plato. Maybe some of you guys dealt with this in your own college education or other times. That Plato offers us examples of so-called a priori thinking, um, which is where you've got an ideal and you start with that general ideal and then you reason down to individual facts or individual actions based on that ideal up there. Aristotle, on the other hand, aha, is not an idealist, he's an empiricist. Aristotle says, no, no, don't start up there and then reason down. Start down here by looking at the facts and use that to figure out what the actual ideas are. Empirical thinking. Um, it's the difference between deductive and inductive thinking and all that stuff. Um, and you, know, you get this simplistic dichotomy that the sciences are Aristotle, empirical, and that the humanities are Plato, they're idealistic. Um, and sometimes I've, I've met scientists and I work with a lot of scientists um, who think that, well, the scientific approach, the empirical approach, is the factual approach, it's the best approach. Um, all of that irrational, idealistic, um, you know, quasi-rational humanities thinking is not right. Um, Thomas Kuhn, <clears throat> famous physicist, historian, philosopher, who, among other things, ended up teaching at MIT, said, that's a fallacy. And he himself was a scientist. He said, look, you can take two scientists and you can show them exactly the same set of data. And those two scientists can come to completely different conclusions based on that same data. You know, it's not necessarily likely that they will, but they can. Uh, why? It's because each of those two scientists has assimilated a different grammar of life, a different syntax for making sense of the reality around them. That's what the humanities trades in. Um, that's what I would suggest the humanities can do for your daughter. That kind of thing might make her more human. The last thing I would say, just to end the meeting, I'll shut up, um, is that the humanities are under fire right now, nationwide. There's been a big downturn in the humanities. In fact, I don't know if you picked up the student newspaper while you were hanging around campus so far this morning. It's the front page story. Um, and they're slumping at Wellesley as well. Not as badly as at some places, but they're not, we're not faring as well as um, at some of the places we like to compare ourselves to. Um, and one of the reasons for this is the economic downturn. Um, and you know this very well. I mean, it costs money to live. It costs money to go to college. You don't want your daughter to live in a cardboard box down by the river when she graduates from Wellesley. You want her to be gainfully employed. And there, there is nervousness out there in the United States um, that humanists are not well positioned to do that. So that if you major in philosophy, or you major in music, or Russian literature, you're, you may be in some trouble. Um, I won't get into the empirical and um, idealistic uh, arguments, uh, pro or con, I'll simply say that I think what the humanities give you, that ability to see the syntax of life, is something that no matter what you end up going out and doing, is going to be something that you'll be able, be able to apply to just about anything. And it's going to make you effective at what you do, whether it's becoming a professional dog walker or a stockbroker or a poet or um, Donald Trump, I don't know. Um, so, and if you don't believe me, look what I brought along with me. I, I brought along an article from Forbes magazine. I confess to you, I, I, I'm not a reader of Forbes magazine, but I'm becoming more interested in such things. It says, this is, a, this is an article that came out, I don't know, three weeks ago? Um, no, about a month ago. Um, and the, the headline is, that useless, <coughs> in quotation marks, liberal arts degree has become tech's hottest ticket. And it's all about how now in the tech industry, and I grew up in what is now called Silicon Valley, all those Silicon Valley firms are hiring humanists like crazy, people with humanities backgrounds, precisely because they, they've got enough coders, they've got enough computer science majors, not to put down your daughter who may be a computer science major. What they don't have are people <laughs> who step back and um, as the as the head of Facebook in, in the UK recently put it, 
can step back and ask, what is it that makes us human? And what do we humans want from each other? Questions like this, that enables you to organize the company to produce something that is actually going to be useful to human beings. Anyway, it's kind of an interesting article. So, for, so those of you who are going to raise your hand and say, but my daughter's going to be an employee, I'll just say, here. <laughs> um, OK, so the last thing I'll leave you with is just a brief quotation from my favorite Russian writer. And I shouldn't confess this to you, because I try to keep my students guessing about which one I like best. Um, but it's Tolstoy. I don't know how many Tolstoy fans we have in the, in the room. But I'm very fond of him. So, this is a quotation from his confession. We'll, I'll end with this and then we'll be quiet. <clears throat> he wrote this in the early 1880s. Reason worked. He's talking about his own life. Reason worked, but something else was also working, which I can only call a consciousness of life. And in the light of reason, the whole of my former explanation flew to atoms. But a time came when I ceased to believe in the finite. I wish to recognize anything that is inexplicable as being so, not because the demands of my reason are wrong. They are right, and apart from them, I can understand nothing, but because I recognize the limits of my intellect. Thanks. OK, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about Russian writers, about the humanities, about your daughter's roommate. Um, <laughs> so what does a young woman with a Russian area studies look forward to? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, preface it, I'll preface the answer by saying um, what students have been doing with Russian and Russian area studies majors in recent years for the last, I would say, at least the last five years, they have, without exception, been double majoring. I don't know if your daughter's talked to you about this or you to her. Um, but students have, and they call them, diff they use different labels to describe them, the, the heart major and the head major, or the passion major and the practical major, <laughs> the impractical major and the useful major. <laughs> so, you know, we have people who do things like political science and Russian, or economics and Russian, or computer science and Russian. I mean, one of our, our, our most talented young uh, Russianists in my department who's helping me design the humanities web page is, is a computer science and Russian double major. Um, so many of them go on and do that, that other thing or something, you know, after they graduate, they'll, they'll go on and, and do um, something related to the so-called practical major. So that, that's one answer. But I would say that um, our majors have gone on to do more things than I can describe. I mean, the fact is that, and I don't know, how the rest of you feel about this and what you're doing now for a living. Um, if you went to college, how much does what you do now really have to do with what you majored in in college or what you studied in college? Um, in, this, in, the, in the kind of superficial sense, you know, so in other words, if you were an economics major, are you in finance right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I am arguing that what you learn in college is affecting how you do your job and what you do, but, but in that kind of direct relationship. And the answer is, you know, look, our graduates, and we, so it's not a big department, we have three people. We graduate about five majors a year. Um, and they go on, I would say about a third of them go on and do something Russia related. So for example, one of them is working in um, a non-governmental organization, a non-profit in Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, you know, Russian speaking and Kyrgyz speaking republic. Another one is doing similar work, working for a nonprofit in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, <clears throat> others have gone on. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, is there water around here? I, I have a terrible cold, by the way, which is why I sound like Yoda this morning. <laughs> uh, others have gone on and, and gone into banking. Some have become doctors. Some have become lawyers. Um, so I would say about two thirds of them go on, and they just do just regular jobs that don't really have anything to do with Russia. Some do um, love the Russian thing so much that they go on and do something like that. Diplomacy, you know, we have students who've gone, who are working with the State Department now, so government is another popular option. Um, and they go for Russia-related things in government. We've, got, we've had several who've gone to, gone to work, at least fresh out of Wellesley, in the Peace Corps, in Russian-speaking um, parts of the world, so things like that. But it runs the gamut. I mean, if I showed you the list, and I should have a list, I mean, I should, have, I should be able to rattle them off better than I can. Um, I think you'd see that 
our list would look a lot like the list of the philosophy department or the uh, music department. Yeah. Yeah. How many women at Wellesley have either a humanities major or a double major? You know, I, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, if, if my computer's not working, I mean, I could try to bring up the statistics. The place to look for that is in something called the Fact Book, which is published, and it's online, you can see it if you want. It's um, published by the Office of Institutional Research. So I'm saying all this so you can Google it when we're done. Um, and look, the most recent one is the 2014-2015 Fact Book. The most popular major is economics. The second most popular major is, um, help me if, 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 Laura, if you happen to know, it's, I want to say it's, it's probably, it used to be English, but I don't think it's English anymore, because they've been slipping a little bit with this downturn. Um, psychology is number two or three, maybe. Um, and then it's, it's sort of, those are the big ones. Um, so I'm not being very helpful here, but because I don't know the statistics that, that well. The humanities <coughs> majors tend to be way, way down the list of most popular major. Um, one of the, well, one of the reasons for that is also that there are lots of different humanities departments. So, I mean, one of the things to remember about this place is there's an average of about 10 departments and programs over in science, in the Science Center. 10, that's it. There are about 10 in social science. In my buildings, in Founders and Green, where the humanities are, we have over 30 departments and programs. So we have lots of little specialized departments. 15 of those are language programs that are housed in about, um, I don't know, about 10 different departments. So I, I don't know if you knew this about Wellesley, but we, got, we teach more languages than Middlebury does. How about them apples? Um, we teach 15 languages. Middlebury only teaches 13. You know which ones we teach that they don't? Languages. Portuguese? No, uh, they teach Portuguese. Oh. They have some Portuguese. Hindi, Urdu, that's one. Korean is the other. How cool is that? <laughs> so, you know, among other things, make sure your, your daughters take a language here, even if they took one in high school. This is a great place to study language. I'm sorry, this is morphing into an advertisement for the language. But I don't really have a great. Yeah, and, and so what, what percentage t in total of our graduates major in humanities? I don't know. I've got to figure this out. I haven't, I haven't seen the statistic. I think it's probably something like a third, well, one something of the like that. that. One of the things that impressed me when my daughter was looking at Wellesley, mm -hmm. and quite honestly, having been a Cal graduate had gone to a very large institution yeah. and had a very kind of sterile education, one of the things that interested me was when I looked through everything on the Wellesley websites, and they were speaking with students, and students were indicating their, their majors, yeah. the number of them that had dual majors, and how distinct those majors were. And right. I didn't see that in really any other institution, the Claremont McKenna's, you know, yeah. um, any of those. And so I do, I, that's the reason I've wondered. Yeah, and you, I mean, I'm, and I'm curious how you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, or anybody else in the room feels about that. Is that a good thing, do you think? I mean, is it is I think it it's good? an essential thing. Oh, yeah. so, you, so you think it's good to have the, uh, the sort of humanities thing, and then the other thing, that, and, and that the two are kind of different from one another, yeah. The students definitely think it's a good thing. I mean, they're doing it in droves. It's really, it's a terrific thing. Um, it's, it, it's funny, I talk to my colleagues in the humanities and people have different views of it. I mean, I, I'd say on, on the whole, most of us are probably happy that students are doing that, if, if for no other reason than because if they weren't doing that, we wouldn't have any majors. <laughs> you know, so they're, they're, they're at least, they've got a toe in the humanities. Um, but, you know, I think the argument can be made also that it makes you more versatile. I mean, if you're doing those two different things, um, that's, that's good. One, one knock against the double majoring that we see so common now is that um, when you spend all your time satisfying the requirements for two majors, that ties up, that ties your hands a lot for branching out into other things. So, yeah, yes, it does create, you know, sort of a dualistic versatility, but not a kind of multifarious um, versatility. It doesn't let you do as many different things. But, you know, the jury's out of that stuff. Yeah. Well, to that end, in your syntax, 
grammar analogy. <clears throat> do you, let's say that the students are majoring in engineering or a hard science. Yeah. Is there a requirement that they take art <coughs> history courses or they take? Uh, yeah. Because that way, and, and vice versa. Is there a requirement that the art history major has to take an engineering course? Yeah. At Wellesley? Yeah, there is. Okay. Um, yeah, in fact, they're called distribution requirements here. And I, I don't know how many of you have tried to come to terms with the distribution requirements here. I mean, it is, they are Byzantine in their complexity. I mean, I, I confess to you, I, don't, I can't rattle them off to you. I mean, it, it, they're very complicated. But yes, they, they're, they're there to ensure that students um, have to have a little bit of everything from across the college. Um, and that's not the only model. I mean, you know, for example, maybe you know that at Brown, you're free as a bird. I mean, the only requirements at Brown University are your major requirements. Um, so you, you must satisfy those. But apart from that, okay, take what you want. Um, so if you want to take nothing but Russian classes, you know, in addition to your engineering major at Brown, you can. And I think Amherst is a little bit more like that as well, right? Um, I'll be honest with you, some of, as I'm gathering opinions from my um, colleagues in, in humanistic disciplines, a lot of them are saying, you know, maybe it's time to back off of the distribution requirements, which may sound counterintuitive. It may sound like, well, wait a minute, those requirements are the only thing that is, is keeping the humanities alive. I mean, you know, otherwise they'd all be stampeding over to engineering and physics and computer science. Um, but some people have argued that freeing the students completely will give them even more leeway to skew toward the humanities. You know, and I, I'm not pretending to know the answer. I don't, no one knows. And if they tell you they know, they're lying, I think. But, um, but some people, there, I've talked to a, a number of colleagues who think it's time to revisit that, all those distribution requirements, which we hammered out back in, like, in the, the mid-90s when we came up with all those. Um, and I will say, I mean, I hope I'm not coming across as an anti-science person, because I'm not. I, I teach. I co-teach, I should say, the first and possibly still the only, although I'm not totally sure about this, joint science humanities course at the college, which is a, it's a course devoted to the study of Lake Baikal in Siberia, the, the oldest, deepest, most voluminous lake in the world. It's also the most biotically diverse environment in the world. Um, I teach the culture half of the course, which is about the role of Lake Baikal in Russian and Siberian culture, art, music, history, religion. Um, and my colleague, the wonderful limnologist, which means freshwater ecologist, um, Marianne Moore from Biological Sciences, she teaches the science half of it. So we have students who do hard science. I mean, they're not doing joke science. In fact, we've taught the course, what, six times, I guess, and maybe four of those times, the resulting experimentation has ended up published. That doesn't happen after every biology class that they take, but it happens after the biology class. I'm just bragging a little bit. Um, so I, you know, and so we, we, and that class is 12 students only. It's by um, application only, and we take about half scientists and make them study Russian as one of the prerequisites. And we take the Russianists and we make them study science as one of the prerequisites. And then we take them to Siberia and watch them experiment on the lake by day, and then in the afternoon and evening cultural lectures, cultural interaction, um, humanistical activities, and it works great. Because they are all so excited to be taken and to spend a month um, at Lake Baikal, which is one of the, one of the true wonders of the world. Um, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I've, I deeply believe, maybe this is the way I should summarize it, I deeply believe in the symbiosis among the disciplines. This is the, that is to say, among the divisions. I believe that the liberal arts education is the best education. I, I love mine at Pomona. Um, I see it working for your daughters here because all of those, all three of the divisions um, make you better at doing each of those individual um, divisional intellectual tasks. So you're a better biologist if you study Russian literature. You're better at, Russian, you're better at studying Russian literature if you've studied the methods of biology. Um, I believe that deeply. I really think that happens here. It's a good thing. All right, how are we doing, Laura? I mean, yeah, tell me when to stop. We have lunch then. I don't, any more questions? Yeah. I mean, if you want to hang out afterwards and, and chat, I'd be glad to.
It may be a question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that course where they you combine synth sciences. Mm -hmm. Are there other courses or other um, examples at Wellesley where they do something similar? Um. Not, not really. There's a there's a cool course on cities that's co-taught between the English department and the sociology department mm -hmm. by Kate Brogan over in English and Lee Cuba in sociology, and they focus. On a, on a series of cities, and <coughs> they approach um, urban life and urban culture from the standpoint of literature and the humanities, and also from the standpoint of social studies. So they, you know, they do sociological analyses of certain phenomena in certain cities, and then they also take a look at um, the literary life, the, art, the life of the arts in those cities, and how those two seem to affect each other. I don't know of one. I don't know. I, I keep looking over Laura's. You, you know, you know the curriculum I, better than I do. I uh, I don't think there's one that, that links science and mm -hmm. humanities. Um, you know, and the way I'll be frank with you, the way we're able to pull it off, and I, the reason it works, and it does work, I and mean, we've been teaching it since 2001, so it's been a decade and a half, um, is because we we are focusing it on. A, a site of such tremendous natural beauty and majesty and grandeur and awe-inspiring characteristics. I mean, 20% of the world's surface fresh water is contained in that one lake. Did you know this? 20%. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, this place is spectacular, and students know it's spectacular. It's legendary in Russian culture, and among people who sort of are into the outdoors, it's sort of like Yellowstone or something. So anyway, when you organize the course around the study of that kind of natural site, you can make, it works to sort of bring scientists and humans together. Um, so I, have, I do think it's an exportable idea. I mean, I think you could, you know, you could find a, a splendid um, uh, national park in Sichuan, China, and you could do a similar thing between the Chinese department and the biology department, or geology department. Yeah. And so, and I'm seeking to promote this, I'm just getting started. Um, yeah, sure. Have you ever considered bringing the prehistory of Lake Baikal? Oh yeah, oh, I we mean, do. You, there are immense opportunities. Absolutely. Oh yeah, but no, we've had paleoanthropologists come and give guest lectures in the course. I mean, that's the other wonderful thing. Everybody wants to come and give a guest talk about it because it's just so fascinating. And and yes, um, so sure. Yeah. Someone else had another comment or question. Well, yeah. About the distribution requirements. <laughs> yeah. So one of the one of the advantages to lessening the requirements is then the students can dig, be deeper into something that they're interested in. But then to think about that from the, from the college's side, it almost sounds like the whole structure would have to change. How does the college support deeper in so many possible yeah, things? Yeah, I, that, I don't know. I mean, that's a riddle. I'm not sure how to solve it. Um, you know, what I can tell you is that one of my jobs this fall that I've set for myself is to try to organize my my humanities colleagues um, into groups to try to hash, hash out these problems, and to come up with actual policy proposals and changes that could help us out. Because, once again, to speak frankly, I, I you know, Wellesley is a wonderful institution, truly. Um, we don't do, we're not responding at Wellesley to the national downturn in the humanities as ideally as we might, I think. You know, it's just, and it's not because we're bad or lazy, it just has evolved that way. And I think what's happening now is the humanities departments are finally starting to sit up and stand up and say, wait a minute, we need to change the way we do certain things. So, so I don't have a specific solution to that problem, but um, we are going to try to do something about this. And I do think there's some policy changes we can make that are going to help us a little bit. Yeah. So we won't be shooting the humanities in the foot quite as much as like, we have in the past. Yeah. Go ahead. You mentioned that you don't have your um, computer in front of you, so you can't necessarily <laughs> yeah. um, offer statistics, but, but because of the, of the accessibility to the other local campuses, MIT, Brandeis, yeah. et cetera, is there a discussion about maybe accessing some of those courses and making them core courses so that you can read it to kind of tandem as you've done in your yeah, that's, that's a really important advantage to studying here, and it is being taken advantage of. Um, I don't know the numbers, like you said, I, I don't know how many students are taking advantage of it, but 
certainly there are students who do the joint Wellesley MIT degree where they can do engineering at MIT, they can do liberal arts here at Wellesley. I, how long did they take? Five years to do this? I can never remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's five years, and you get you get the two degrees. Similar thing is going on with Olin College, which is this wonderful, tiny engineering institution that's you know, I'm pointing over that way. Um, it's whatever. It's a mile and a half from where we're sitting here, um, and uh, you know there's perfectly free, unhindered cross registration um, among. Those two institutions, Olin and Wellesley, MIT and Wellesley, MIT and Babson College, you can take business classes over there, and also Wellesley and Brandeis. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes some energy, and it takes some logistical kind of know-how, and uh, it's complicated right, to sort of find, find a way to get yourself physically from here to Cambridge so you can go to MIT. So there are some barriers to it, but they're, they're not, I don't think they're kind of intellectual or curricular they're more kind of logistical, physical barriers. So not as many students do it as as might. Um, but it's a great option. Yeah. Do you, do you feel that the advisors, is this something that the advisors actually promote and offer? Or is it something where they're saying, you know, it will take you a three and a half hour, you know, it's a three and a half hour chunk out of your day. Yeah, yeah. Just one hour faster. You know, Every, we don't have a kind of professional advisor core here. Um, the people advising your daughters are just faculty like me, and different people emphasize different things. I mean, my personal approach is that it's a great idea, go for it, but understand that it is a three hour chunk out, out of your day in order to make it happen. And you're just gonna have to figure out whether you can make that work in your life, you know? And I, not to be a wet blanket about it, you know? And I, and I, I also say this once again to credit, um, you know, to defend myself, I am the son of two engineers. I mean, I come from, and I come from Silicon Valley. I mean, I, I know the whole engineering thing, and I, I value it very highly. Um, it's just a little tricky to make it happen. Um, yeah. You know the combinations that you're talking about, like with Lake Bacall. Yeah. Are they short-term courses, or is that a semester abroad, or? Is that a January short term, or? The particular example of the Baikal course, uh -huh. um, it's spring here on campus. Spring. So spring semester, a whole semester. First half of that semester, they're with me, reading literature, reading history, religion, anthropological sources, um, folklore sources. And then the second half of that spring semester, send them over to Marianne Ward in biology. She takes them out and teaches them all the field methods they're gonna to need to know to be, to be able to do serious limnological work once they're at the lake. So then there's a whole semester. And then we all say goodbye to each other in May. And then we reconvene at Logan Airport at the end of July. And then we fly together to Siberia and we spend a month at the lake actually carrying out um, and investigating the things we've learned, both humanistical things and scientific things. Mm -hmm. So it's, so yeah, so it's a whole semester plus a month. And students get a little bit extra of extra credit for that. Mm -hmm. They get 1.25 units, I guess. So a unit and a quarter. Mm -hmm. And they deserve it. Believe me, they earn it. The students, <laughs> the students who take that class, they, they should get even more than that. That's the way it is. Okay. Well, maybe we should wrap up, because um, I know you've got stuff to do. Thank you for listening and thank, thank you for your you. questions. <laughs> uh, enjoy your weekend. <laughs>